Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Brian Lehrer, host of The Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC. And this is kind of a... I have to say this is kind of a relief after talking about the Eric Garner case all morning. <laughs> but in a way, everything relates because when you get down deep enough, even from an act of, um, you know, a police encounter with a community member that results in death, people wind up saying, well, this isn't just about police policy. This is about community empowerment. This is about social structures. This is about having things to do in the neighborhood uh, for young people that are going to avoid those kinds of contacts with the police. Even though Eric Garner was in his 40s, the um, community level work that is being done by libraries, being done by other community organizations, is really the foundation of our city. And unfortunately, it comes to the public, into the public discussion uh, through things like Eric Garner sometimes. And it needs to take place day in and day out and week in and week out on all kinds of levels that might be seem, that might seem um, dry and technical and academic and wonky to people um, on a general basis, but that's why I so appreciate being invited here today to participate in this, because this is how our city gets better and better and better through this and meetings like this. Um, so thank you all for coming. Let me, instead of introducing you, let me just ask you to go down the row and just very briefly introduce yourselves, and then we'll get your responses to the, to the presentations we just saw. Want to start here? Sure. Hello, everyone. Hi, uh, hi, honored to be here today. My name is Ju K. Su. I'm the founder of Coalition for Queens, or C4Q. We focus on fostering the tech sector in Queens, particularly empowering low income and minority communities. I'm also a trustee of the Queens Public Library. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Jimmy Van Bramer. I am a City Council member, chair of the Cultural Affairs Committee, and uh, before I got elected, I worked for the Queens Library for 11 years. Uh, so libraries have been my life's work for the last 16 or so years, and it's an honor to be here, and really, really grateful to Cuff, uh, to Jonathan, and David, and the entire team, because just actually seeing those presentations got me excited, just because we're all here, we're all talking and thinking about libraries, that's very, very exciting. Uh, Kyle Kimball, uh, President of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, um, and I'm also a trustee of Brooklyn Public Library. Stelios Vasilakis, Director of Programs and Strategic Initiatives for the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. Diana Reina, Deputy Borough President in Brooklyn, uh, representing what would be the new Borough President in Brooklyn, Eric L. Adams, and a former council member for 12 years in the Williamsburg, Bushwick, and Ridgewood, Queens area, uh, where I served with our great uh, cultural affairs chair. Um, so it's a privilege to be here, and I want to really thank Jonathan uh, for really uh, taking the library discussion to an invigorating and uh, challenging uh, discussion level, because it's about time. and. It's important that we understand this isn't about staying in the past, but rather seeking a future for a library system. Thank you. Stilos, could you talk for a few minutes about your work in Athens and maybe relate it to uh, some of the presentations we just saw? Because it seems like so much of the struggle, if struggle is not too strong a word, is to identify and then implement uh, kind of the new generation functions that people either do already or want to associate with libraries to make them, you know, serious community hubs and not just places where hard copy books are, are stored. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, what we're doing in Athens, actually, we have undertaken an, a very large project uh, where we're building new facilities for the National Library of Greece, the Greek National Opera, and a very large uh, public park. The architect is Renzo Piano, and um, the project is about one and a half year away from completion. Now, what we're trying to do with the National Library of Greece, it's basically take an institution which is rather introverted, antiquated, and insular, 
and turn it upside down and, and do exactly the opposite with it. This is an institution that has functioned for a very long period of time, it's been in existence for over 100 years, as uh, a research library. It doesn't get that much traffic. On an average day, you can find 40, 50 people, the most there, in the heart of Athens, right next to the university, in the heart of the historic city. Um, it's not a lending library. So we are building a really large new facility for this institution. And in the process, we have tried to think very carefully how we can make it relevant. It does not exist in the consciousness of the Greek public as an institution. If you stop your average Greek on the street today or five, six years ago, and you've asked him, do you know where the public library, the national library is, they probably would have said no. They would have had no idea. So um, the way to do this, we, we took a risk, actually. And it's interesting that the library agreed to this plan because we basically have asked them to uh, visualize a library that it's not a national library in the traditional sense of the world. And there was a lot of resistance to it at the beginning. So the new facilities, basically, are going to have, it's about uh, 236,000 square feet. And uh, it would include a national library, a traditional component, but also it will include a public library as well. So the ground floor, which is about 80,000 square feet, is gonna be a public library, which will include everything that one sees in your average public or municipal library around the world, in New York City, in Helsinki, anywhere you go, you will see the services that public libraries and municipal libraries offer, they will be offered in the public side of the Greek National Library. That includes uh, media labs for young people, that includes a business center, that includes a lot of different programs, engaging different age groups, engaging the community, engaging other nonprofit organizations, um, working together to do programs with the opera, which is the next door neighbor, working together to do programs in the park because it is located within a large park and engaging basically the community. And uh, we thought that this would be the only way really to get people to visit the National Library of Greece if we change its character completely. What we also did before in the process of thinking about all that and after we had decided we wanted to go that way was to also engage small public and municipal libraries around the country, to re-energize them, to introduce different types of public programs there, to see what the response would be, um, how the public would react in that. And we have done that in over 120 libraries, public and municipal libraries around the country. And what we have seen is the response of the public. People respond to reading programs, people re respond to media labs, uh, people respond to, respond to going there and get uh, information about how to start a business, respond basically to uh, libraries that they address the needs of the community. And that's what we are trying to do at the new National Library of Greece, in a nutshell. I'm going to ask you a quick follow-up question, which is, how do you think that relates to the New York experience? Is there a particular lesson to be taken here from that? We actually visited a lot of uh, libraries in the New York, uh, around the New York um, metropolitan area, and we did learn a tremendous amount of things from them. We have also supported libraries around the city, starting with the New York Public Library for a long time. So we have learned uh, a tremendous uh, amount of things from these libraries and visiting other libraries around the world as well. Um, but I have to say that listening to the presentations right before us, all of a sudden there were a lot of questions that came up to my mind and um, I, perhaps other people can get a chance to talk and then we can maybe come back to them. <laughs> because all of a sudden I became a lot, very skeptical about a lot of things. Okay. <laughs> you, you can't leave it on that though. <laughs> now you have to tell us at least one or two. Um, we kept talking about uh, focusing on community, uh, that a library becoming a community hub. And this is something that we've done in Athens as well, and there's a lot of emphasis going into it. 
but I've just came from a conference in, at CERN in uh, Switzerland at the Particle Accelerator and on the ideas of conflict in science and society. And everybody talked about this world going becoming a virtual world, young people operating in a virtual environment. So we're talking about a lot about libraries becoming community hubs, but communities are becoming virtual communities. If we are talking about libraries being community hubs, are we talking about libraries becoming obsolete because communities in the next 50, 60, 70 years, or even in the next 10 or 15 years, will be virtual communities? That's how young people work today. They work in virtual communities. That's one of them. I am also worried about the idea that libraries do everything. I keep worrying that we keep trying to find new activities, new functions to add to libraries in order to make them relevant. How much can one do that without uh, taking away completely of what makes a library a library? How can you have an identity when you keep adding things and we keep trying to reinvent libraries as being an institution that does everything. What does that mean at the end? Now you've started a conversation. <laughs> Jimmy Van Bramer, I think you're nodding the most vigorously, so why don't you pick it up? Well, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, glad that that was said because I was thinking something very similar, and that is that it seems to me that while we always can do better and can always think about ways in which library design and graphics can enhance the customer experience. I kept thinking, we approach this from almost a place where there's a problem, that uh, libraries somehow aren't working. And the truth is that libraries are working. They do incredible work today. Right now, in every single community where there's a community library, there are people, immigrants, children, poor folks, seniors, finding libraries, and they are going to a better place because of the libraries that exist today. So libraries work. The gate count alone demonstrates that we are in a place where we have failing institutions that need to be rescued. The truth is we're doing great work. We don't have a problem with our libraries. We have a political problem in terms of generating the political will to fund everything that we need funding. And so I, I, I think that some of the designs that I saw were very exciting, and it's, it's, it, we should be looking at the Astoria branch, which is one of the oldest branches in Queens. It, it is a Carnegie, and it's been changed over the years, and I've been in that community room many, many times um, for meetings. But uh, the truth is communities change around the buildings that uh, we build. And our job, as folks who love libraries, is to make sure that the libraries are changing with those communities. I think that we do. I think libraries are doing great work. And we are always thinking about what we can do more, how we can meet the needs of people where they are at. The libraries are doing that, right? There's a great new program, 10,000 uh, new devices being loaned out, making sure that the technology is there, reaching out to uh, immigrant communities. But I, I just want to say, uh, while we can and should look at how design uh, can and should add to the experience, I come from a place that these institutions are serving the people of the city well. They would do even better to have beautiful graphics and a yellow brick road showing folks in Astoria where the, or blue yellow brick road, where the meeting room is. But the libraries would do even better if they had a billion dollars in capital funding to make sure they could do the things they need. And we had libraries open six and seven days a week. That's what we need to do so that the great people who are at the libraries doing the work today can do even more. But then as a member of city council on the body that would actually vote the funding, um, how does that intersect with what Stelios was just saying? Do you need to walk away from do libraries need to walk away from libraries or everything? I mean, I was taking notes, early childhood, cooking classes, tech help, job readiness, story time, ESOL, what isn't it? Uh, and focus on a few core competencies. Is that going to serve the communities better? Or is it going to be by doing everything and everything and everything, and they're just hoping that you can procure more funding? Well, uh, first of all, I think libraries have always done it. Uh, uh, and, and we're always looking to do more. 
Uh, but maybe with the exception of the cooking class, everything that you just said, I think libraries have been doing since they began. And, and, and yes, they're doing more in terms of technology and we're lending out uh, devices, but that's because those things didn't even exist. Uh, so libraries are catching up. Um, uh, I think we're always trying to prove our relevance, always trying to prove our value and our worth. The city council, I might say, and, and uh, Deputy Borough President Reyna was uh, a very great member for 12 years and is still doing great work, but the city council has always supported libraries. What we need is a partnership at City Hall to make sure that any administration is willing to meet us halfway and get libraries to where they need to be. This is not just a city council issue. This is a city issue. It's about leadership, and we need the administration to come in halfway and make sure that libraries get what they need. And so, EDC President Kyle Kimball, I you, think Kyle. that's your cue. And I love Kyle Kimball's socks. Can I just say that? Those are the best socks ever. I really wish I was wearing his socks today. So. <laughs> I, I did think of that. Uh, you know, it's funny. I was looking through, I was listening to the, the presentations, and obviously I'm wearing two hats, um, in both as which uh, are re relative to the representing the administration as a mayoral appointee to the trustees of Brooklyn Public Library as well as president of the EDC. And I was struck in the presentations, um, and this is gonna be a roundabout way of answering that piece, is it strikes me that the library conversation is really a metaphor, and this, this question of what role libraries are playing, are they doing enough, are they doing too much? Um, and it seems like the general feeling is that libraries can do more, you know, libraries are doing a lot, and they're overburdened, but hey, they could do so much more. And for me, that conversation is more about a metaphor that they're, in an, in an urban environment, um, what is missing, they, because, because what's happened is libraries have become a gap filler um, for a lot of families in terms of after school childcare, mm -hmm. in terms of people who don't have access to technology, uh, in terms of people who just need a, some shelter. Um, throughout the course of the day to someone who's looking to study for the LSAT. Um, so it's, it's filling a gap for, and what that to me says in terms of the design piece, that it's actually not about books and libraries, that it's about something that's missing in the public space. Um, because, and that is a sheltered public space. We have parks, we have plazas, we have a lot of different public space, but we don't generally have sheltered public space. And I would actually disagree that people are working in virtual communities. I think we thought people were going to work in vir virtual communities. Um, but what's really happening in terms of the, the workforce is that uh, people are very hungry for a shared space professionally as well. And so you've seen a complete change in the work in the professional environment towards shared spaces. You're seeing a complete revolution in the economy in terms of uh, the sharing economy and the emergence of you know, it went from, well, that's crazy, that's a great idea, we should probably all just share one rental car, to now we're talking about sharing tools, sharing a 3D printer, uh, sharing a, uh, a book printer. Um, and so to me, I actually think communities are coming together um, in, in the same way we are working more virtually in that I can work with someone in Greece uh, on the same project virtually, at the you know, or I can share a Google document with them. At the same time, I want to be able to share a 3D printer with someone, uh, and, and I should be able to go to the library, I should be able to send my 3D print to the library. And so to me, both are happening, both virtual, but at the same time, there's an emergence of a sharing economy where the community is actually coming more together than it ever actually really has been. So on the administration piece, I think, I think that in terms of moving the administration and in terms of moving the council or whoever is going to help pay for this, that it has to be not just about books and libraries, but, but a recognition that in an urban environment there's just a something, there's just a critical piece of infrastructure that's missing. Do they then, as a matter of economic development in the city where it intersects with the rest of your work, need to move physically from where they are as the model that we saw with the 1960s and 70s you know, 65 one-story freestanding buildings wrong for today? Do they need to be more integrated into retail strips, as I think came up earlier in the conference? Uh, is that an important um, um, transformation that needs to take place? I think that's certainly a model that we have looked at at the Brooklyn Public Library in terms of expanding reach 
reducing, because it's a great way from a pragmatic standpoint to reduce uh, some capital exposures or some operational exposures by having a more rationalized footprint in a higher trafficked place, maybe a smaller retail setup and, and something that's, because uh, sometimes libraries tend to be out on their own uh, and sort of isolated and, and not necessarily near traffic. And so, you know, downscaling and um, recognizing what that community means. I think it's a community by community piece. Um, so I wouldn't rule it out. It's certainly something we've looked at in terms of expanding the reach of Brooklyn Public Library in a way that reduces operational and expenditures. But I have to say that there is, you know, putting it in a retail strip um, is good, but I don't think it's necessarily in and of itself a, a, a catalyst for, for major change. Diana Reyna, where do you want to jump in? Well, when I saw the, thank you, when I saw the presentation as far as um, designs and new ideas, it didn't speak to what are we doing about the billions of dollars that we need in order to invest into upgrading and necessary um, emergency repairs that are real today. And I value the ideas that were presented because they, they bring to life what is in print, in books, in a library. But if we're not able to fund through a capital campaign, what are these structures? Um, some more challenging than others, um, then we're right where we left off. And so that is one component that I would have loved to have seen more um, dealt with in this presentation so that we start talking about what we have above the library, where the concept of why just have an open space underneath and elevate for a more resilient model um, and create what would be an open space underneath the library and redesign it so that the library is above but overarching open space and dealing with what would be another superstorm, God forbid. But in addition to that, the air rights. We're the city of New York. Why are we not creating a whole new zoning code that would capture these zoning air rights and create a fund that would be rededicated to supporting a capital campaign for these libraries? And if we don't do that, then we will never see those dollars. And it doesn't matter how much of a commitment we have with a mayoral administration versus the council and the budget dance, because at the end of the day, it's all about a negotiation. And there is no one fund dedicated constantly towards that particular uh, effort. And so we want to be able to uh, come up with these real aspects of how to pay for these upgrades and these challenging re emergency repairs. It also takes very long to get these repairs done. I know in, in my council days, I, re I had committed dollars to a roof replacement of a roof that was already replaced. And 300, I think $500,000 later, I don't know that that roof has been repaired still. And it rains inside the library because there's leakage, because the roof was not done completely correctly the first time around. And it's a Carnegie library. And what's even worse is that inside at this library, this is my local library, and I'm the local council member. And so walking in with my child who was a baby at, at, at that time, there was no um, baby change table in the bathroom. And we're asking for more programming, uh, you know, mommy and me classes. Well, what are we saying to mothers with their babies if we don't even have the changing table for them, right? And it's a real infrastructure issue. And so engaging community at the infrastructure issue is just as important as the programming. And so we want to be able to see this revenue generating and the capital funds like an air rights fund dedicated to libraries, but we need the community to be supportive of that as well. And I also just wanted to share the UPK seats that we need in the city of New York today. Our libraries are open during the day hours when people are working. Why are they not open at, at night during weekends? 
Why can't we turn our library spaces into UPK spaces so that children have space to go to a safe educational environment where the infrastructure is already there? Expose them to a volume of books and then shut down what would be as a school or UPK seats. And that does not mean that the library is not open for business. It just means you're sharing cost. You're sharing operating functionality. You're sharing what is the idea of uh, capitalizing space where we are in need as a city to provide childcare system and educational uh, space for our children and there's a lack of space. And we are also in need of operating costs and infrastructure costs. Well, there's money dedicated to that and we have to spend and we have to find that space. It exists. And then when we turn it around, you have what would be a day and evening city asset that is giving to our community in all f facets. Drew okay, so. Thank you. I agree with much of what has been said, and I think our public libraries do a great job. Um, but, but I do think there, there obviously could be a lot more being done. Um, and, you know, I, I want to kind of disagree with um, some of the things also that have been said. I do believe that libraries should be monumental. Um, and just speaking from a personal perspective, right? Like, you know, I, I was raised in Queens, and I remember when the Flushing Library branch was opened. And I was just so incredibly inspired by the building and kind of the physical asset and space that existed there. And I think that's a really important thing to showcase in different communities when people may not otherwise have access to those things. And so that physical space as a you know, public cathedral for, for learning or education, I, I think is really important. But that, that's not to say that obviously a lot of capital structure issues and economic issues. So how do we address that? You know, and this is not just a loan for the library system, right? Like you look at the larger economic trend, like there are no more bookstores, right? Like independent bookstores are leaving. There's one bookstore in the Bronx, right? One Barnes and Noble, and there was an uproar recently about them possibly leaving the Bronx. Right? And that's because the shift, you know, just the economic cost of these things and the shift of Amazon technology is changing the structure of that. So what does that mean? You know, how do we use technology and how does that going to affect these things? You know, and I think, you know, thinking, being forward thinking about that. You know, it would be unconscionable if there were no bookstores at all in a borough like the Bronx, right? But if Barnes & Noble, a economically driven, market driven entity can't support that, well, maybe that's a role that the public library should play, right? Well, what does that apply for the role of the public libraries? You know, maybe, and then maybe this is a radical idea, but partner with Amazon, right? Like, you know, Amazon's going to continue to exist. They're going to want to sell books in different locations. Um, if you have lending systems there and libraries sell books and they're delivered these different spaces in these different communities, that's an additional revenue stream. I mean, that brings a level of commercialization that doesn't exist right now. Um, but, you know, I think it's important to consider these larger economic factors. Um, other rules of technology that people have talked about, um, like the, 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 the lending tablets, I think it's great what Google's been doing, donating a million dollars to support this. And I think what's great about that is because it's an analogous model to what we know now that, you know, instead of lending books, you're lending tablets. But in many ways, I think we need to challenge ourselves to think like, beyond the existing models, not just blending things. How can we better incorporate technology to, to do this? Um, and I, I don't know the exact answer, but I do think it's thinking about the larger economic trend of how technology is shifting this, and it's really focused on what is the library's unique value proposition. So I believe, you know, Stelios, I believe, was right. I think the libraries do do a lot, but, you know, what, what should this be in the future? We should focus on some things. There's obviously a lot of capital needs, and I know, you know, we have all these great council members and former council members, you know, getting the resources um, that we have, but we have limited resources. So how can we build support outside of that, among stakeholders to do that? Um, and one idea, uh, Cheryl Ephraim was here earlier, but this is actually her idea with the uh, Ribson Foundation. I think it's a, it's a really great one. Um, you, know, you know, building larger community engagement. Um, there was a presentation earlier about 
you know, engaging the affluent in the library system. And I think what's great about the library, it's such an emotional thing, and there's a cross-section of people that engage with it. Um, I think if it's a parallel to other groups like transportation, why not help support and build a community group like Transportation Alternatives that's been able to build all the support for transportation and public transportation here in New York? Can you do that for the library system? You know, like, I know my friends are really into libraries, but they and reading and book clubs, but they may not be doing that now. There's no venue to do that. That will help build additional support and stakeholder support for additional resources. We shouldn't see it as just like a fundraising mechanism, but think about how to engage other aspects of society as well. There's a lot there. Who wants to react to some of that? Uh, I wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, uh, say that uh, I love uh, Diana Reyna and uh, uh, everything uh, that she said, and I, I just wanted to add to that that uh, there is a document that speaks to the long-term uh, capital needs of the city of New York. Uh, it's our 10-year capital plan, uh, and it's coming out uh, early next year, and that is an opportunity for all of us uh, working together with uh, uh, the mayor and uh, all of the folks in city government to make sure that, that the, the needs of the libraries are met. Uh, just like any other core agency providing services to the people of New York, libraries need to be in that plan, just as any other uh, agency. We're a little bit different, but uh, the needs are, are just as uh, valuable, and, uh, and we need to serve them. Uh, I love what Juke said about uh, libraries being monumental. Uh, I, too, believe that um, uh, because they're aspirational, when a building like the new Flushing Library is there, looking like that, that sends a message to the people of Flushing and to the people of Queens uh, that this is an institution that's important, that your life is, is important, and what's inside this building is really, really special. It's transformative. That building was transformative. Libraries can and should be transformative in every community, and, and we should build monumental libraries, aspirational libraries, in the center of communities. Um, uh, not saying that we can't do some of those pop-up things and, and some of the other ideas which are, which are great and fun to, to entertain, uh, but libraries should be central at, because they are, and, and I believe they always will be, about people and communities and having them at the center of communities and building them big, building them beautiful, uh, and building them in, in substantial ways is really, really important. The one thing I would say, uh, uh, Chuke mentioned possibly charging um, uh, for books or selling books, um, and I think other than book sales, I would be against that, um, uh, because I think the fundamental contract that we in the public library world have with the city of New York and with people and with civilization is that these services will be provided uh, free of charge um, uh, and the government will fund uh, these, these organizations uh, because that's a social contract. We should stick to that. Uh, we know who uses the libraries uh, and, and we need libraries to be free and open and democratic and accessible to everybody and, and, uh, and then the government needs to do its part. Although I totally love where everyone's going in terms of exploring other opportunities for um, uh, funding uh, buildings and, and, and whatnot, but there is a core uh, responsibility of government to fund libraries, and we should never walk away from it. Kyle, as an economic development person, can you bridge those two to some degree? Bridge the two. Well, I'm thinking. I don't models. know. Do, do, yeah. Kate, do, you, you, that's, that's what you mean. To, yeah. To, to charge for. Uh, right. I don't mean to say to charge for selling books, but if you know, there are companies like Ship, right, where it's a tech company, it's you know, they allow delivery services. Libraries are distributed centers in these communities. Well, if there are no bookstores in the future, you can borrow books for free. But if you want to buy something, that's just an easy revenue stream that you capture. The library can capture it from some online retailers. The so library think, would get a cut because that's the place from where the order originates. Exactly. Exactly. Not charge for any library services. Right, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm looking at Jeanette Moy, who's our director of uh, so strategic radical planning at uh, <laughs> Brooklyn uh, Public Library, and it's it's just funny. But um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, listen, I think from an economic development standpoint, um, you know, it, it comes back to me for me that you know, in order to 
position New York City as, uh, my job is to position New York City's economy along with Deputy Mayor Glenn uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to think about how to position New York City as a, a dynamic, sustainable, and equitable economy. And that really means really thinking about our traditional industries, how they're being disrupted, and making sure that traditional industries in New York City are able to survive that disruption. And that means really focusing on innovation, both for our traditional industries and for our, uh, do, the new industries emerging as well. And I think libraries, in many ways, are no different in that it is, a, it is an industry, uh, it's a not-for-profit industry that is being disrupted um, by a number of different factors in terms of the idea that, the fundamental idea of books is being disrupted, um, the fundamental idea of, of space and how they're financed uh, is being disrupted. Uh, the, the fundamental idea of who's going there is being, has been disrupted. Uh, I think the, the most striking um, graphic we saw in the presentations, just going back to the presentations for a second, is the uh, mock-up of the New York Magazine about when did libraries become cool. <laughs> and I, I bristle at the idea of um, engage, that leaving a critical infrastructure asset to the affluent. Um, to me, I, I agree with, with Councilmember Van Bramer that we do have a res fundamental responsibility, I think, to fund this. But I do think you have to look at it as an infrastructure asset, as something that's critical to uh, the innovation economy, uh, connecting people to that innovation economy, because sometimes when you talk about an innovation economy, it's code for a certain type of people and a certain class of people who are educated um, and have access to the money and time to take risks and be innovative. Uh, and there's a lot of people in, in, uh, around the city who do not have the money or resources to take those kind of risks. And the problem is that we could create a system where they are able to go to the library to take those risks. And so I think that's the component of economic development that you could see. Maybe every library branch should install 100 electrical outlets. For, for as, as a start. And then everybody will come. <laughs> That'll cost money. Yeah, That's I mean, right. I was impressed with the Cuff report um, that they went to the trouble of counting the electrical outlets yeah. because I because it seems it seems um, at this at, it seems at one point basic that you would have enough electrical outlets, but it's I, I like the fact that they picked up on the idea that that is a fundamental mm -hmm. infrastructure mm -hmm. asset for That's the innovation exactly economy, right. right? And if you don't have electrical outlets, people aren't bringing their laptops, they're not coming to the library. You are not relevant. Stelios, look what you've started. <laughs> Where would you like to jump back in? Um, I, yes, the, you know, the fundamental you know, idea of books has been disrupted, but the notion of reading has not. People read more than any other time in history, actually. They read in different ways than before, but they do read a lot. And we ought to think whether or not libraries will remain places where people go to read. Maybe it sounds like a strange and outdated idea, but um, that was uh, the function of a library, and we have to consider whether or not this can still be a function of a library today. I mean, I, I think we're having a discussion here in New York because, uh, you know, in, in New York we are reconsidering our commitment to public institutions. You know, is there enough funding? Can we justify the presence of these libraries? Can they be justified as places where people went to read? or do we need to start doing away uh, with them, or we need to reconfigure them so we justify their existence. But I would like to say that if you go to Europe, or if you go to other places in the world, but that fundamental commitment to libraries still exists. You go to Birmingham, where they have a fabulous, brand new public library. You go to Manchester, where they have a fabulous, brand new public library, municipal library, and reading, remains a fundamental aspect of these libraries, and they're packed every day. They have added new things, digital programs for you know, media labs, all these things, technology, innovation, experimentation, has become part of the libraries, but they still are places where the community goes to read. You go to Bibliothèque Nationale, which is like a church, actually. It is so quiet, you cannot imagine that young people who want to even cross the steps of that place. It's packed every day. There's a waiting list of 2,000 people to get in every day, and all they do is sit down and read. They may read through their computers, they may read manuscripts, but they do that. 
So um, that remains a fundamental aspect of what libraries do. We're not re-examining the way museums are functioning today because they keep showing art and people seem to keep flocking to them. But we keep questioning again the role of libraries. And I just wonder why. Why this you know, constant need to re-examine the role of libraries, especially you know, in, in today's society? Does your experience in Europe or anything you just described suggest new uh, fundraising models, including ways of capital camp structuring capital campaigns or anything else? Yes, I mean the state usually supports public institutions much more than they, you know, they do in this country. But that model is changing, and also there, and they're under pressure to raise, you know, private funds. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, there remains a commitment from the state to these institutions. That's the bottom line, a fundamental commitment. They do have to raise money more and more and more so, but there is a commitment also to, to the institution. Diana Reina, do you have ideas of how, because you were speaking eloquently before about the needs, the, the variety of capital needs and operational needs for the libraries. Any thoughts about how to procure that other than just, um, you know, professing your love for Jimmy Bramer and <laughs> helping you deliver. I think you, you missed the part where I said an, an, a fund created with air rights of the library. So the point I, I was trying to make is that our libraries are standalone boxes where above it there's a rich wealth of pot if we create it as the city of New York. And as a government, can we create a fund, right, where this fund can be dedicated, and we've done it, it's not, it's not uh, new. Uh, we have created a fund for the Industrial Manufacturing Fund. Um, I know because I did that through a rezoning for manufacturing businesses to develop new space because we were encroaching on our manufacturing industrial spaces and converting them because the competing factor here is always real estate, uh, residential units. The issue of our libraries as an asset and what is above it and the fact that we're not doing anything with it and to be able to create something with it to generate the revenue that they need to make sure that these buildings are going to exist for another 100 years. I grew up in a Carnegie library and I literally mean that because I was a latchkey kid with my sisters. That was our safe haven. So the gap filler has always been there. Whether it was the Great Depression, the 70s, or the new millennium, it's always been the gap filler. Because that is where you gravitated for exposure, for safety. You trust the library. You are able to engage with the library. It is your security blanket. Um, to be able to understand that there are neighborhoods that have the library as the babysitter um, because there is no other choice. You have libraries that have iPads and others that don't. And it depends where you live as to what exposure you're going to have to infrastructure. Um, so there, there's a real discussion here that we can always try to gloss over um, by focusing it on programming. Programming to me has never been the issue. It's the revenue. It's how do we get to the opportunity where we're seeing the dollars invested in these buildings so that we can continue to have them for the next generations to follow. We in, the, in Borough Hall created a round table discussion, a task force, a library task force with friends groups. And we made a call out to all friends groups throughout Brooklyn. And it was very uh, obvious that the libraries that had friends group were in the minority, right? Majority of Brooklyn do not have friends groups that are activated. And these friends groups that did come out, of all the friends groups, there's only one friends group that has a 501c3 status to fundraise. That is a fundamental reality as to where, bless you, uh, the focus of how we're trying to activate community and where to steer their energy 
And is there an interest to participate in the role of raising capital? The campaign of, of a citywide campaign. I just want to end with this. This particular group expressed the interest of working towards these types of uh, innovative ideas for capital fundraising. The naming rights was a particular one of interest as an idea to be able to float around. Barbara Streisand is from Brooklyn. Why can't we get Barbara Streisand to give naming rights? To be able to say uh, that she's going to uh, be chair to a fundraising committee for her name and, and this is what it's going to be able to generate as far as revenue is concerned. Would you take corporate naming rights? Why not? Any, anything and everything can be explored, whether or not the community is going to embrace it and the library system will support it is another question. Juke, you'll get the last word in this panel. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> just to clarify again, I, I do believe the library plays a fundamental role for access and opportunity. Um, and something that we, we did touch upon, I think Kyle touched upon, everyone kind of touched upon, just even basic access to the internet. Um, that's something the tablets are trying to provide. You know, their estimates from Center for Urban Future, from their previous reports, and floating around anywhere from 1.8 million to 2.5 million New Yorkers on the internet at home. That, that's, you know, just a, I mean, think about it, that's a, such a substantial amount of New York City's population without even basic access information. So I do believe that could be a fundamental role that the library can, should continue to serve. But I do think we need to think about how it is as an institution and what other ways to generate revenue and build support. You know, whether it's a point of sale system, whether it's distributed centers, whether it's, I really think, like the, the friends groups building, again, like a transportation alternatives like organization that's citywide to build support for things like, you know, that they've done for bike plans, right? Or, you know, look at the Brooklyn Food Co-op. You know, why not, you know, everyone should have free access to libraries, but maybe there's a new volunteer model that we can take from, you know, other analogous kind of institutions and other industries. And I think those are the kind of creative things, and I'm very new to this, but um, I think, you know, we should uh, kind of think about and explore. Please thank all our panelists for this important conversation.